I searched the world But it couldn't fill me Man's empty praise and treasures that fade Never enough You came along Put me back together Call me friend, cause the God of the mountain is the God of the valley. There's not a place your mercy and grace won't find me again. Oh, there's nothing better than you. There's nothing better than you. There's nothing, nothing is better than you. Oh, there's nothing better than you. There's nothing better than you, Lord. There's nothing, nothing is better than you. Dancing, you get beautiful ashes, you turn Satan into glory, you're the only one who can. You turn mourning to dancing, you get beautiful ashes, you turn shame into glory, you're the only one who can. You turn graves into gardens, you turn bones into armies, you turn seas into highways, you're the only one who can, you're the only one who can. Oh, there's nothing better than you, there's nothing better than you. Lord, there's nothing, nothing is better than you. Oh, there's nothing better than you. There's nothing better than you, Lord. There's nothing, nothing is better than you. You turn mourning to dancing. You get beautiful ashes. You turn shame into glory. You're the only one who can. You turn graves into gardens. You turn bones into armies. You turn seas into highways. You're the only one who can. You're the only one. You're the only one who can. He turns our shame into glory. He's the only one that can do that. When all I see is the battle. You see my victory When all I see is the mountain You see the mountain move And as I walk through the shadow 
everybody. Woo, good to see you guys. And we got some, some kin of Miss Glory over here. Uh, as you guys know, we are uh, ce- going to celebrate her 90th birthday, so after service. So uh, more information on that. But it's good to see uh, your folks here and uh, just, just great, great people. So uh, if you have not um, set, said hi, please do so uh, for Miss Glory today as we celebrate 90 years of glory, right? Amen. Amen. How many of you guys want to live to that age? I do. Surpass that, <laughs> seriously, right? So, amen. All right, a few uh, quick announcements. Um, today, after, uh, during, at the end of the service, we're going to have the Lord's Supper, so be uh, in preparation for that. And also, next week is Mother's Day, okay? That's the last time I'm going to say it, okay? So, if you, uh, just to FYI, because guys, we kind of forget at, at times, so you might want to put that in your calendar or like an alarm or something like that, so you can remember. Um, the following week, on the week of the uh, of uh, 514 uh, through the 16th, it's our women's ministry, right, as they're going to go into our their women's retreat. So if you've not signed up, you need to do so as soon as possible and pay your deposit. Uh, and then on the 23rd, we're going to have our fish fry uh, right after service, okay? So if you have equipment that we could use that you want to lend to us, like burners and and strainers and all that stuff, those big pots, uh, please uh, feel free to reach out to Larry because uh, he's going to go ahead and, and, and lead that uh, engagement for us as a church. And um, so we are also going to have our members orientation 
uh, that is uh, supposedly done um, today but it, or this week, uh, but we have to postpone. So make sure you see Brother Wendell and Miss Cynthia about that. Uh, if you're interested in joining our church or just wanting to learn more about it, we'd love to give you that information. And last but not least, we have uh, our mission trip in the summer to Brownsville, Texas uh, with Hendrick Mission Center. Uh, if you've not completed that, those application as well or registration, make sure you do that so we can finally get a, a, a count. Closer to the mission trip, we'll have a quick meeting after service so we can kind of discuss. Uh, for those that have not been on the mission trip with us, uh, we won't give you that information. Whew, all right, that's a lot of information. Okay, so, um, so I just want to just first of all say thank you so much for choosing to worship with us today. Beautiful day, right, after all the rain bands and all that stuff. It's great to see the sun, but most importantly, we celebrate the sun right? We Amen. celebrate Jesus Christ, Amen. and that is the most important thing. So this is your time to be able to worship him and feed from him and his word so that we can be equipped in doing what God has called each one of us to do. Let's do that, all right? So I'm going to give it to Brother Carl, and uh, you take us over on our offering. Gentlemen, if you would come forward at this time, we're going to um, go into our time of worship where we join together in receiving from each of us what God has Gentlemen, anybody? Come on, Mason. <laughs> you and Joel, and I need uh, one other person. All right, thank you so much. So um, the way we work in the kingdom of God is we work as a body. So every part pulls its part. And if, you've, if you're getting old like me, there are parts that don't work as well as they used to, but they're still there. Amen? Hello? Hello? Is this, this thing working? Yeah. So um, we all got to pull together, guys. And that includes our online family. Those of you joining us in Facebook Live, uh, we all need to pull our weight together so that we can continue to serve this community and as it spreads out from this community. Because we take the gospel from this place. Amen? Hello? Hello? Amen? Amen? Yeah. Thought I thought I could hear a little murmur there. So let's go to the Lord in prayer. Father, we thank you so much for your love for us. We come before you asking, Father, that first of all, you'd get our hearts right, that we would come before you today and, and just if there's anything in our heart that needs to be confessed, we just ask forgiveness for that, God. We come together as a body of believers who want to worship you and we want to do that with clean hearts, with pure hands, with, with, with right motives. God, that we would do everything in, in front of you in a way that you would appreciate it so that we would come before you and be able to really worship and to really give of ourselves. God, you said that, you, you, that we could call out and that you would answer us, and, and you promised us that you would show us in your word. You promised us that you would show us great and mighty things. You also promised us that you would do good things for us, not things to bring us harm, but to, to give us a future and a hope. And God, we thank you for that future and hope. And I pray that you will hear our cry, God, that you would continue for everyone for all of this body of believers to meet their needs, Father. We know that there are people who have financial needs. We know there are people who have physical needs. We know that there are people dealing with illnesses. And so, God, we just lift these things up to you. We know that it's their heart's desire that you would answer in each of these areas for their, their individual lives. And so, Father, we lift up our body of believers to you this day, that your name would be glorified in us, that you would give us strength so that we could go out and give ourselves 100% to serving you, Father. So we, we surrender our, ourselves to you this day. I pray that you would do with us as you please. I pray that you'd show us your way, how we might walk with you humbly. Holy Spirit, open our eyes as we begin to study your word together today, as we continue to worship, Father. May we do it in a spirit of love and, God, complete surrender to you. So I pray your blessing over this time of offering, that your name would be glorified in the things that we do as a body of believers. If we give out food, that it'll be in your name. If we give out clothing, it's in your name. If we give somebody a cool drink of water, it's in your name. If we meet a need, however that, however that happens, God, may your name be glorified. So thank you for this day. In Jesus' name, amen.
Come thou fount of every blessing Tune my heart to sing thy grace Streams of mercy never ceasing Call for songs of loudest praise Teach me some melodious song Sung by flaming tongues above Praise His name, I'm fixed upon it Name of God's redeeming love uh, Love has blessed me, thou hast brought me to this place, and I know thy hand will bring me safely home by thy good grace. Jesus sought me when a stranger, wandering from the fold of God, he to rescue me from pain. Walk me with his precious blood. Oh, the grace, how great a debtor, daily I'm constrained to be. Let thy goodness, like a fetter, bind my wandering heart to thee. Prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Here's my heart, Lord, take and seal it. Seal it for thy courts above. Here's my heart, Lord, take and seal it. Seal it for thy courts Yes, I am. In my 
Father's house There's a place for me I'm a child of God Yes, I am In my Father's house There's a place for me I'm a child of God Yes, I How great the chasm that lay between us How high the mountains I could not climb In desperation I turned to heaven And swung your name into the night Then through the darkness your loving kindness tore through the shadows of my soul. The work is finished, the end is written. Jesus Christ, my living Lord. Who could imagine? So great a mercy, what heart could fathom such boundless grace? The God of ages stepped down from glory to wear my sin and bear my shame. The cross has spoken, I am forgiven. Cause me his own beautiful Savior, I'm yours forever. Jesus Christ, my living Lord. Hallelujah! Praise the one who set me free. Hallelujah! Death has lost its Death 
has lost its grip on me. You have broken every chain. There's salvation in your name. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Oh God, you are my living heaven how could we possibly keep silent when we come to the realization that you alone not only are our living hope but you are living in us the hope of glory thank you Lord Jesus for your everlasting gift of love that you sp- you spread you, you shed your blood on Calvary you, you broke your body there you gave yourself for us so that we could come before you, confess our sin, declare, Lord Jesus, I love you. I believe that you are God's only begotten Son. I believe that you gave yourself on the cross as a perfect sacrifice. I believe that you went into the grave literally dead, and I believe that on the third day you rose again. How could we possibly keep silent with such good news in our hearts? God, help us to go from this place today to spread that message wherever we go, to our friends, to our family, to our co-workers, wherever you take us, God, help us to be faithful, to be your messengers. God, we just lift up Pastor Jackson this morning, that he would come before you, Lord, that he would open his heart and his mind, and Holy Spirit, that you would fill him and give him words to speak so that today you would pierce our hearts with your word, Father. Help us to hear you. Help us to not only hear you, but to act on what we hear, God, to be obedient to you. We lift this up in the name of our precious Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. All right. So if you were to name a person you would aspire to be, who's alive in 2021, who would that be? No, no Sunday school answers here, okay? All right. It has to be someone that's living today. Well, according to pop culture, here are some people you may or may not know that people aspire to be. All right? First one is this gentleman right here. Who is this gentleman? Right? So if you receive these Amazon boxes like many of you guys know about, this is him, right? Jeff Bezos, right? The uh, CEO operator of Amazon, all right, based in Washington. His net worth is one hundred and eighty one billion dollars he's the richest man in the world today so the next gentleman you may know as well right bill gates okay founder of uh, ceo of microsoft his net worth is a hundred and twenty four point two billion dollars and maybe this person rings a bell to you Elon Musk, right? He, in his, his, uh, he was a dropout in, in college, and uh, he fa- co-founded PayPal, sold it, and is now CEO of Tesla Motors and SpaceX. And his net worth is $163.7 billion. And for some of you wrestling fans may know this gentleman right here. I don't know his net worth, but guess what? Everyone knows this guy, okay? Dwayne Johnson, okay, from Hawaii. He played college football and made it to WWF, and now he's in every movie, right, and commercial that you could think about. Now, if you're, if you, yes, that too. And if you're a, if you're, if you're a person that love uh, cosmetics, you might know this person, right? Kylie Jenner. She's the youngest billionaire after starting her own cosmetic business, and she's voted the youngest ever self-made billionaire in 2019. And perhaps you may know this person if you're into Marvel movies, Robert Downey Jr., right? He was known for playing movie uh, where he starred as a Charlie Chaplin, Sherlock Holmes, and Iron Man, okay? 
Now, if you're not into movies, but into more physical activities, you may know this gentleman, right? Cristiano Ronaldo, right? If you guys know who he is, he's a soccer player, the highest paid celebrity, according to Forbes, in 2020. And if you're not into sports or wrestling, cosmetics, you perhaps may know of this gentleman, right? Right? Hunting and fishing and loving every day, right? I have to look this up. I really, I, I don't know about Luke Bryan. Now, if, if you don't like music, uh, this type of music genre, perhaps you may know this gentleman that Jason uh, Alexander may like a lot. It was his favorite person growing up. Bieber, okay? I don't know his net worth, but he's a Canadian pop, a pop singer uh, that we have. I'm sure these people are not even close to where you even consider a person that you aspire. But perhaps it's someone closer to you than a celebrity. Perhaps it's someone closer to you that knows you intimately. Perhaps it's your grandmother. Perhaps it's your father. It's your mother. Perhaps it's someone that's, that's very close to you, that knows all about you, that's outside the family. Maybe a spiritual leader. Maybe someone that you aspire to be. I wanted to share a person you aspire may, may, uh, may just have a name, a little, very little information that we have about this person. But it's a person that would host Paul and Silas and Timothy in their missionary journey in Thessalonica. So if you want to turn your Bibles to, I'm sorry, to Acts chapter 17. Acts chapter 17. You see, this gentleman had associated himself to these individuals, made him a target for yielding to Jesus Christ versus the king of the land, which was Caesar. He gave it all and he paid for it. So let us read Acts chapter 17, verse 1 to 9. Let's all stand up in reverence of the word as we read God's word. Now then they traveled through Amphipolis and Apollonia, and they came to Thessalonica, where there was a synagogue for the Jews. And according to Paul's customs, he went to them, and for three Sabbaths reasoning with them from the Scriptures and explaining and giving evidence that Christ had to suffer and rise again from the dead. And saying this, Jesus, whom I'm proclaiming to you, is the Christ. And some of them were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas along with the large number of God-fearing Greeks and a number of leading women. But the Jews, becoming jealous, taking some uh, along some wickedness men from the marketplace, formed a mob and set the city in an uproar and attacking the house of Jason. They were seeking to bring them out of the people, and when they did not find them, they began dragging Jason and some brethren before the city authorities, shouting, These men who had upset the world has come here also, and Jason has welcomed them. And they all acted contrary to the decrees of Caesar, saying that there is another king, Jesus. And they stirred up the crowd and the city authorities who heard these things. And when they received the pledge from Jason and the others, they released them. You may be seated. Thank you so much. So we see Paul and Silas and Timothy travel inward to Europe, right? And this, this southern part of Macedonia during Paul's missionary journey. The city was called Thessalonica, right? One cool thing about Thessalonica is that it is the capital of Macedon, or the co-capital along Constantinople. It's the second largest city in Greece today. The name Thessalonica was named after the Macedonian general Cassander's wife. During the Byzantine Empire, it's known for its major trade routes between the east and the west. Right? It's, it is Greeks, uh, uh, Greece's second ma uh, major economic and industrial, commercial, political center but most importantly, it is the city known for its festivals, its events, vibrant cultural life in general, and is considered to be Greece's cultural capital. So why did Paul go to the city? I think it says it there. There's, there is an attraction of people and customs in that region. So similarly here, 
in Texas, right, people go to Austin, right? People go to these big cities, Dallas, Fort Worth area, to see the culture, to taste the food, to know the people, et cetera, et cetera. They come to Houston for these things. So moreover, Thessalonica was a, had also amazing views on the mountainous side on the east and the Gulf waters to the west. So if you've ever driven to, uh, if you've ever been to San Diego, it's kind of like that type of, uh, uh, of topography, right? Minus the politics and the taxes, of course, right? Great weather, great waves, and great people. So why did Paul and his companions go to Thessalonica, as I said? They were mission-minded for Jesus Christ, that they did everything they can to ensure that the gospel of Jesus Christ was preached. They wanted to ensure that all had equal opportunity to hear the gospel of Jesus that saves lives and souls for eternity. That is our greatest purpose as Christians today. See, Paul finds a common place to start this dialogue between these people. See, as men that stands for Jesus, Paul and his companions encounter people in the synagogue of the Jews. And according to Paul's custom, he went to them, the three Sabbaths reasoning uh, with them with the scriptures. So, so Paul goes to these people. So remember, this is, a, this is a land where there's many different cultures, Greek influence, many gods, polytheistic theology, where there are gods for everything. But he goes there and he begins to teach one thing that was so significant is Christ. Christ is the answer for it all. You see, in those type of country, in those type of uh, that type type of time, is that there are many gods for everything. There's a god for cows. There's a god for moons. There's gods for seasons. There's gods for infertility and all that's the fertility gods. All these different gods. But he knows. Paul knows, and he presses on. There's only one God. So we all know that we were all born once, right? And we're all gonna die, right? But what we do in between that time is significant whether or not we are going to inherit eternal life. See, there are many roads, as they say, to heaven. But but Paul says there's only one, and it's Christ Jesus, the God-man who came in human flesh. He's 100% God and 100% man to die for you and I's sin. There's only one way. I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but me. But see, what we do in our culture is we try to use our behaviors or our finance or our securities to overcompensate for that. But we know, we know that that does not equate to salvation. Your good behaviors, your law-abiding citizenship does not account for you to go to heaven. Being and living in North America as Americans does not equate for you to come to heaven. It's only through Christ. And he thrusts this to these Jews and Gentiles and God-fearing people. But what happened was is that he attracted. There are people listening. So, so the title today that I have is When a Man Stands for Jesus, and it's also applicable for women, When a Woman Stands for Jesus. What happens? See, a man of God stands for Jesus if he's consciously aware of God's presence. A man of God stands for Jesus if he's consciously aware of God's presence. Something that only God can do. See, he was witnessing this. He lived in the very this culture where it's enmeshed with every type of God. But he sees there's something different. You see, the city of Thessalonica were filled with subculture of many gods, variety of influences such as trade, commerce, culture, and people coming from different backgrounds and lifestyle. Yet there's a synagogue where the Jews were present and God-fearing Greeks, Gentiles, and a number of women who were of prominence. See, in Israel, it is illegal for the Jews and for the Gentiles to come together. You don't see that. And if you go to Israel today, you will see the, 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 Jewish, col- uh, um, sorry, the Jewish quarters and the Gentile quarters. And they know they hate each other. I mean, they're very open about it. There's no sensitivity at all. 
So in, in Israel, it's illegal. Jews were on one side of the city. The Gentiles were on the other side. Women cannot come to worship God in the synagogue, right? That's the, that's the culture of that. But something, just something happened here in Thessalonica that is very different. It is assumed that Jason witnessed all this happening. He, he sees people, Greeks and women, get saved after hearing the message of Paul about Jesus as, as Paul explains and gives evidence that Jesus Christ is the God-man. See, Jason, Jason witnesses life's change, open doors, open opportunities, and for the Greeks to become children of God. He experienced that the philosophies and the, the, of the Greeks are, contra, are a contradiction. The gods of the Greeks were finite. They were limited. They were impersonal. As an eyewitness to these events, three Sabbath of, uh, Sabbaths of Paul's attempt to teaching and giving evidence of the supremacy of Christ and how he overcame death is ultimate. Jason witnesses these events before his eyes because he's aware of God's presence in the midst. See, as a man of God, you ought to see, as a woman of God, you ought to see the spiritual happenings in your surrounding, right? You have to see it, okay? So how do, do we, as men and women, have a conscious awareness of God? I'm going to give you some tidbits of this. See, living in a conscious awareness of God's presence should be the desire of every believer, it is asking the Lord before church starts today, oh Lord, be with us during this service. God, make it cl very clear in his word that he's always with us. Perhaps we need to pray that God would help us to be more consciously aware of his presence. But I'm sure there are times when we sense God's presence and sometimes we feel that he is distant, right? Right? especially when we go through difficult times and circumstances in life. But it is possible to know God and the facts about Him, His universe, His works, and His children, even when we walk through the valley of shadow of death. So that's when we desire, we should aspire, Lord God, I know You exist. You created me. You know when I was born. You know when I was in my mom's womb. And You know when I'm going to die. Help me to be aware of your presence, dear God. Right? Especially, especially when hard times come, because we all been there. Let me just share with you an illustration. As you guys know, in my career, you know, working by vocation, I work with uh, cancer patients, pediatric cancer patients. So when we when we have this diagnostic talk with those families, we sit down together with the doctors and everyone and the family. I'm there with them, and we tell them. Your child has leukemia. The devastation of the family, you can look in their eyes and you see the pain. But what's great about it, and this is God's working, is that so, unfortunately, sometimes, most of these kids do very well. They're very resilient in cancer. Only the 20% don't do very well. And these are the 20% that I'm particularly speaking of. These are the 20% that perhaps relapse after years of chemo. And we finally tell them, you know, it's not working. The doctors tell them it's not working. We're going to have to go with option A. What is option A? Perhaps it's more chemo. What is option B? Maybe bone marrow transplant. And what's great is that behind the scenes, what we're doing and, and our, 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 our scientists and our, our, our researchers are doing tissue typing with the family. And when we sit down with the family and say, the doctors sit down and, and say, we have an option for you. We found a match in your family. And it's one of your child, your, the, your, the patient's sibling, who is a 100% match to your child. And when we see that occur, we see the greatness of God. We are a sense of awareness of God when these families' eyes, these parents' eyes are filled with tears of joy that their child, their other child, can save their child that has cancer. It is amazing to see that. You sense, and, and I've been in many of these conversations, I get goosebumps just talking about it. 
because I see the lifted, the, 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 awa- the awareness of God's uh, power in the midst of that situation. And many of you guys, that's just one story that you may not have walked, but perhaps you've walked in other journeys that you know only God can bring you through. Right? That is the sense of awareness that I'm talking about. See, a man of God, a woman of God knows that because we know that we're created for a purpose. We're created for a reason. We're not just random chance that two cells came together and lo and behold, that's where we are. God has a plan. He has a purpose plan for us. We need to be aware on His working in our lives. Right? There are many examples and situations that I'm sure you can tell of God's presence in your life. See, once we sense God's presence, we acknowledge that God is um, omnipresent, God is holy, God is infinite, and God is love. God knows everything. God can do anything that is consistent to his nature, to name a few of his attributes. These truths can touch our hearts and also our daily experiences. So what's, what's, what's the answer, Pastor? How do I have a sense of awareness of God? I'm going to give it to you. Three words. Live in Him. you got to live in Him. Right? And this is something you can't create. You can't, like, orchestrate this yourself. You're either with Him, you're either for Him, or against Him. You're either His child or not. And what's great is He invites everyone from different cultures, different experiences, different backgrounds to come to Him. He's so, so inviting to everybody. Here's a fact. Living with the conscious awareness of God's presence can and should have a significant and positive difference in the life of every Christian. This is a fact. You have to know Him. You have to live in Him. Living with the conscious awareness of God's presence will keep us away from sins as well. We talked about in our our youth group today the sins of our flesh. Right? We all, Jeremiah speaks of this, our heart is deceitful. We talked about emotions a little bit. Just because you feel that way doesn't mean you need to react this way. But when you live in conscious awareness of God, it tells you, man, you're not just some biological being that just happened by chance. You're created for a purpose, and you need to respond with a purpose. Right? Living with consciousness, conscious awareness of God's presence will keep us sensitive. It is an awareness of His closeness will remind us to guard our thoughts, our words, our behaviors, right? One great thing about kind of leading the ministry uh, with, with, with our youth is that they, they report to me what happens at home. <laughs> and I found out a few interesting facts. But you know what I see there? I see people living life. Because we're all sinful, but we need a Savior. We see redemption and how we respond. We see forgiveness. We see communication. We see things working things out, knowing that, yes, we have a a very difficult day or difficult morning, but tomorrow is a new day. That is amazing. Living with the conscious awareness of God's presence will keep us secure See, an awareness of his closeness will remind us that he keeps us and that he cares about us. He, if, you are in, if you are his child, he's not going to let you go. You can run away as far as you can, but you're always one step back. He can redeem you back in his love and his purpose. Let me share with you as we read Psalms 139, one of my favorite psalms, and you're probably saying, you said that many times. Yeah, you got lots of favorite. Yes, I do have lots of favorite psalms, okay? Live with it. But I'm going to read to you this psalm, 139, and it talks about God knowing every single detail of your life. So no matter how you, when you get up this morning, oh, man, I gotta go to church and listen to this pastor. You know, I'm just be honest. It's okay. I can live with it, right? Or you, oh, I gotta go get up, get the kids up, and get dressed, and all all that these things. 
just know that when you're struggling in the morning, when you're like, oh, I just can't wait to get my coffee. I just need that extra boost, right? For me, it's, it's tea at this place over here. And, 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 and I'm not, I'm not, I don't do free advertisement, okay? Uh, I don't own stocks in this, at this place. But it's my tea. It's my tea that gets me up, right? But know the psalm. And it starts here as it speaks to us very clearly. Psalms 130, uh, 139. And we're going to go through the whole thing. As you know, our church, you know, I, I, would, I, I don't want you guys to listen to my words. I want you to listen God, to God's words. This is everlasting. And it starts off here. Lord, you have searched me and known me. <laughs> you know when I sit down. You know when I get up. You understand my thoughts from afar. You scrutinize my path and my lying down and are acquainted with all my ways. So he knows every thought, every action, the words in your lips, the things that you wish you want to say but you couldn't say, right, to your boss or somebody. He knows everything. He knows every single detail about you. And he goes... Even before there's a word on my tongue, behold, Lord, you know it all. You have encircled me behind and in front and placed your hands upon me. See, is that a God of judgment? You know, I'll talk about judgment later on. But this is a God of, of knowing every single detail. He's intimately aware of you and me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It is too high. I cannot comprehend it. My mind blows just for you to think of. You are thinking about me all the time. So whenever you feel like you're all alone, let me encourage you. The God of the heavens knows every single detail about you and me and your neighbor, etc., everything. Where can I go from your spirit? Or where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend to heaven, you are there. If I make my bed in Sheol, behold, you are there. If I take up the wings of the dawn, and if I dwell in the remotest part of the sea, even there your hand will lead me. Your right hand will take hold of me. <laughs> His dominant hand. If I say, surely the darkness overwhelms me, and the light around me will be night. Even darkness is not dark to you. And the night is as bright as day. Darkness and light are alike to you. He created it. He knows everything. One of the, the translations says, if even if you're in the, the deepest part of the abyss, right? The abyss, he is there. You know what's the deepest part of our world? It's in the Marinara Trench in the Pacific. It's, it's miles, miles, miles down. Even if you were to go there and take a submarine down there, he's there with you. Right? It's a movie that I watched, The Abyss, when I was in elementary. Anyway, sorry. For you created my innermost parts. Huh. You wove me in my mother's womb. I will give thanks to you because I'm awesomely... This is great. This is like 2021. Awesomely, wonderfully made. The old version is fearfully and wonderfully made. Wonderful are your works, and my soul knows it very well. So you know that God, the only reason why you're here is because of God. The only reason why I'm here in Waller is because of God. The only reason why I'm alive is because of God. My frame was not hidden from you when I was made in secret and the skillfully formed in the depths of the earth, your eyes have seen my formless substance and in your book were written all the days that were ordained for me. When as yet there was not one of them. See, he knew you before you were born. He knew you before mommy and daddy got together, right? Before grandmother was born, before grandfather was born. He knew everything about you. How precious are your thoughts for me, God. How vast is the sum of them. Where I count them, they would outnumber the sands. 
When I'm awake, I'm still with you. If only you would put the wicked to death, God. Leave me, you men of bloodshed, for they speak against you wickedly. Your enemies take your name in vain. Do I not hate those who hate you, O Lord? And do I not loathe those who rise up against you? I hate them with the utmost hatred. They have become my enemies. So what is he saying there? He's saying that there's evil. But God is ultimately the judge. And we need to defend good and hate evil. Does that make sense? What you watch, what you put and download in your, your head, right? Your memory has to be edifying to God. You want to make sure your, your sense of awareness is purity before God. And there are many things that we can watch that are dark. We can sense darkness. We need to stand strong to the light is what he's saying. In verse 23, search me, O God, and know my heart. Put me to test and know my anxious thoughts. And see if there's any hurtful way in me and lead me in the everlasting way. So he's saying, Lord, you judge me. You teach me. You show things, impurities in my life, things that are not of you. Show, reveal them to me because I want to live, Father, in the light for you. Right? Next point. We only got two points today. That was one. <laughs> Maybe I'll save this for next week. No, just playing. A man of God risks all for Jesus Christ. A man of God risks it all for, Je for Jesus Christ. Verse 5, But the Jews becoming jealous, taking along some wicked men from the marketplace, formed a mob and set the city in an uproar, attacking the house of Jason. And they were seeking to bring them out of the people. When they did not find them, they began dragging Jason and some brethren before the city authorities, shouting, These men who have upset the world has come here also. And Jason had welcomed them. And they all acted contrary to the decrees of Caesar or the law, saying that there's another King Jesus. See, we see Jason's house is attacked by the mob of men, dragging him and others before the governing authorities. This sounds like I've heard this before, right? I mean, look at the news. Sounds like this has happened. When we welcome Christianity and we live it out, we ought to expect implications for jason he hosted paul and his companions and guess what a mob follows in revolt to the message of jesus christ that has been preached ladies and gentlemen christians brothers sisters these days are coming for us i don't want to incite fear or panic but in preparation for you dear christians when we confess that Jesus is our Lord, we ought to expect great persecution and challenges, threats, even death. Be assured, Christ warned us of the following things. And I'm saying this again, if we, we see this theme in, in Acts, it can start at home. Jesus speaks of this. It's not like he, he, he said, well, you know what, these are the fine letters that you're reading that you, 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 you forgot about, Right? You guys signed those contracts. Oh, oh, I didn't see those fine print, right? Jesus is saying it in red letters. This is going to happen. It says so in Matthew chapter uh, 10, 21 and 23. He says, now brothers will betray brother to death. A father, his children, children will rise up against parents and causing them to be put to death. And you'll be hated by all because of my name. But it is the one who has endured to the end who will be saved. But whenever they persecute you in one city, flee to the next. For truly I say to you, you will not finish going through the cities of Israel until the Son of Man comes. So it might hap happen at home. We're already seeing it, right? Brothers against brothers, children against fathers and, and parents, right? Back when I was growing up, we used to watch these shows, I'm sure you know it, Family Matters, Full House, right? Where these parents are revered by the children and they have this talk, 
right? After some situation, they have the music and all that stuff. You can imagine Bob Saget coming down, to, talking to DJ or Stephanie or whatever those little kids' names, right? The Olsen twins, right? But you see there's a flip. Now the parents are mocked. The children rule the house. What they say the parents must do. It's an opposite. And we're already seeing that here. And it's gotten worse. That's when I watch TV, right? It's gotten worse, if you think about it. And it can happen to us nationally. Matthew 24, verse 8 to 11. But all these things were merely the beginning of birth pains. Then they will hand you over to the tribulation and kill you, and you will be hated by all nations because of my name. And at that time, many will fall away, and they will betray one another and hate one another. See, it's not them just hating you. It's hating who you stand for, hating what we stand for. See, we stand in the truth, that truth, the moral truth is ever-present, no matter what part of the country or the world, no matter what time period, it's absolute truth. But what happens is society has changed what truth is. Truth is relative now. What's good for you is good for you, but not for me. That's the reality we live in, right? There's no moral truth, no absolute truth, right? And we see the changes of this. We see Bibles in countries being rewritten to make fun of Christianity. We see it. John 15, 18 says this, If the world hates you, you know that it has hated me before it hated you. So you say, Pastor, I see a theme here. The first gospel is spoken by Paul to the people in the cities he visits. Second, he gets pushed back and there's a riot. Third, he gets threatened, he gets injured, even stoned, even killed. Are you saying that this is going to happen? Absolutely. It's going to happen. If not, it's already happening. You mean that? It didn't include that in the fine print? Yes, I, I told you, right? It says it's in his red letters. It's going to happen. But there is hope. I don't want you to feel depressed and discouraged. There is hope. And the hope is his reward for us that stand strong, that's aware of God's presence, but know that our life here is short, wee bit, poquito, right? Beginning and end. It's very short. But what we do now will indicate where we will spend time in eternity. John 12, 24 to 26 says this. We're almost done. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. The one who loves his life will lose it. And the one who hates his life in this world will keep it to eternal life. If anyone serves me, you must follow me. Where I am, there my servants will also be. If anyone serves me, the Father will honor him. Could it be possibly that your reward is standing strong for the gospel? Yes, there are implications. You may lose a job promotion. You may miss out on a date for you single people, right? You might get defriended right, or canceled out in your Facebook posts for whatever reason. We live in a canceled culture. Whatever you say that's contrary to the world is considered an assault, and they will disarm or put a hold in your account for whatever reason. That's the age that we live in. But I want to give you hope more than anything. You honor the king. You honor the king until you die. Romans chapter 1, and I'll end with this passage, says this it more clearly than anything. Romans chapter 1, verse 16 to 25. This is the last passage, I promise, all right? I know you guys are all hungry for cake and everything. Verse 16 says this, For I'm not ashamed of the gospel. <laughs> for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes. To the Jew first and also to the Greeks. For in it, the
The righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith as it was written, but the righteous one will live by faith. You know who got saved by this passage? Just this passage that we've read? Martin Luther, right? The great reformer. Was he perfect? No. He's a man like you and me, right? But he got saved through this. A lawyer by trade who became a monk, who changed everything, who started a reformation. Verse 18, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteous people of God who suppress the truth in unrighteousness. See, when we give to the world, what we're saying is we're agreeing to the world. Does that make sense? When you say and when you don't stand up to the truth, you're basically saying, I approve of this person. I approve of this lifestyle. Because that which is known by God is evident within them, for God made it evident to them. So he's, they're saying these people that are living unrighteously, they know, they know that they're walking away from the Lord. They're wa- living and, and, and making justifiable accounts for their behavior and their action. So he says this in verse 20, For since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his character that is, his eternal power and his divine nature having been clearly perceived, being understood by what has been made, so that they are without excuse. As a Christian, uh, as a, as before I was a Christian, not growing, a Christian uh, not growing up in a Christian home, not hearing the message of the Bible, not he- even knowing what the Bible is, when I did something bad, I knew I wasn't supposed to do that. Okay? I grew up, grew up in a polytheistic household. No God at home, no prayer, no Christmas, no Christmas tree. That's, the, that's how I grew up. But I knew when I'm about to say something, snarkle at my parents or whatever, or someone of higher authority, I knew at this little age, I knew that was not right. So we all, God knows, God's innately know. He's put the law in our hearts. He knows when we do something. But he says here, they are without excuse. They know when you're sharing the gospel, when certain people are doing certain things, they know that that is not okay because that is sin. Even though they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks. But they became futile in their reasoning, in their senseless hearts. They were darkened. Claiming to be wise, they became fools, and they exchanged the glory of the incorruptible God for an image in the form of corruptible man, birds, and four-footed animals, crawling creatures. These are the gods of the Greeks. Therefore, God gave them up to veil impurity in the lust of their hearts so that their bodies would be dishonored among them. So he's saying, hey, if you want to live that lifestyle, God says, go for it. That's what he's saying. Go for it. If you want to live that lifestyle, that ruthless, lawless lifestyle, go for it. For they exchange the truth of God for falsehood and worship and serve the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. Amen. So as Christians, in closing, we have a choice. God gives us in full disclosure of what is going to happen. He didn't miss any single detail. He's warned us in past. What do we do today to be encouraged and to know that we have to live for Him? And part of that is being aware when He moves, when He does something in your life that only He can explain. You know that God exists. Don't let Satan rob that away from you. Cheapen that from you. Acknowledge his richness. Acknowledge that when, even as you walk through the the valley, a shadow of death, and many of you guys are walking that today. One thing you know about trials is, are three things. You're either in one, you're about to get out of one, or you're about to get into one. That's, that's the purpose of it, right? You're either in it, you're about to get out. 
where you're about to go in. Be prepared, Christians. Be prepared. Let's pray. Lord God, we come before you, and we thank you so much, Lord, for your word, the living, active word that's able to penetrate souls. What's great about the two-edged sword is that it cuts both ways. As I'm sharing this, it cuts to me as well. I want to make sure that I live in integrity of your word. And Lord, we know, many of us know here, we, we know God's words. How do we apply this in our everyday life? Lord, we need to first pray for us to be aware that you are around us. You're around situations that are so deep that we can't even share it. But Lord, you know our innermost parts. You know our being. You know when we, we rise up. You know if we climb Mount St. Helens or to the deepest abyss as the marinere trench, you are there with us. Lord, help us to be encouraged by that. That as long as we're alive today, no matter what profession, no matter what we do, whether we're retired, we're thinking about retired, or just beginning our career, I pray that we would live for you and stand strong to the convictions that you have placed on us. Lord, help us to hate evil. Help us to be aware that when we watch, when we listen, we read things that's contrary to your word, help us to stand strong and help us to not feed those, those deeds in our house, to not have that in our house, Lord. So we come before you. We thank you. Help us to be encouraged and stand truth to your word, knowing, God, that the days ahead of us are uncertain. Father, we love you and give you thanks. I pray for everyone here to stand strong in their faith. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, I want to give you an opportunity to respond. I know this is some heavy stuff, but it's only 11.59. So I want to give you a chance to respond. If you want to pray, this is your opportunity. You know, this is going to be open. We're going to have music playing. This is your opportunity to pray as an individual, as a couple, as a family, you and your son, you or your daughter you and a brother, a sister in the Lord, this is your time to come. You, you come. Are you hurting and broken within you? Overwhelmed by the weight of your sin? Jesus is this calling. Have you come Father's arms are open wide. Forgive.
forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Oh, what a Savior, isn't He wonderful? Sing hallelujah. take a seat as we enter in the time of observance of the Lord's Supper. Uh, today we'll be taking the Lord's Supper, so I'd like to have the ushers come forward and stand beside me, please. Two here and two there. There you go. Face that way. All right. Face that way. There you go. All right. Okay. All right. At the Last Supper, Jesus shared a meal with his disciples, and then he led them in observance of the Feast of Unleavened Bread and Passover. I'm going to go ahead and pass this out.
Jesus, the master teacher, used this opportunity to plant an important memory in his disciples gathered in the upper room. Jesus shared this meal for their benefit and ours today. As Jesus raised the bread and the cup in thanksgiving, he added a new significance to the meaning of the word Passover. Luke 22 records that Jesus told his disciples to observe the Passover in remembrance of me. Jesus took an old symbol and filled it with something new. The meaning of Jesus' words and action is rooted in his command for us to remember. As today's disciples, we observe the Lord's Supper in remembrance of the sacrifice Christ made for us in his suffering and death on the cross. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, Paul gives instruction concerning the Lord's Supper. In doing so, reminds the Christian two things. Number one, their personal salvation in Christ. So for only, this is only reserved for believers in Christ. And that participation of the supper carries inward and outward aspects. Inwardly, participants are to examine themselves spiritually before taking the supper. And outwardly, participants proclaim through the supper the Lord's death until he comes. Luke twenty-two eleven says this, When he had taken some bread and give thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let us partake of the bread. First Corinthians eleven twenty five says this in the same way he took the cup also after the supper, saying, This is the cup of the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it. In remembrance of me. Let us partake of the cup. Let us pray. Lord God, thank you so much. God, you are so good. You're constantly reminding us to remember you and how you live. Lord, you will come. Help us to hold on that hope. As you have risen, you will come again the same way. But in the meantime, Lord, help us to reflect on how you live, Father, for us and how you want us to live for you. Lord, I pray for your hand of forgiveness, of your hand of restoration and redemption for all who come to you and proclaim you as their Lord and Savior. And Lord, help us as we live out our faith to be salt and light. Lord, help us to be influential in our everyday duties, whether we're at home, at the workplace, at school, or whatever we're doing. Help us to be glorifying in everything that we do. And Lord, help us to take you and to live our lives for you. Lord, Father, we ask for your special blessing upon this service as you have. And I pray as we walk out of this presence, this place, Lord, that we'll be equipped in doing what you have called us to do, to make disciples for you. Thank you, Father, for this day. Thank you for the service, Lord. And most importantly, thank you for the word that stands forever in time. In Christ's name we pray, amen, amen. You may be seated. Um, Before I end us in prayer, um, we have just a few kind of quick announcements. As you guys know, we're celebrating Miss Glory's 90th birthday. We have cake there for you, ready to be prepared uh, for you to partake. Um, We also have a, right behind these walls right here as you exit, um, a journal. So if you can write your name and uh, in in commemoration of your celebration for Miss Glory. Miss Glory, why don't you come up over here and we're going to pray for her. Uh, She may need uh, assistance, if not. All right, come on. I'll come over here. You won't. You won't fit over here. Anyway, sorry. Okay, not you, but the the the, the yeah. yeah the walker. So, uh, I just I just want to be clear. All right, we're gonna sing Happy Birthday to you. Happy Birthday to you. Happy Birthday to you. Happy Birthday, dear Glory. Happy birthday to you. Woo-hoo. Amen. 
Amen, amen, amen. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you so much, Lord, for we pray for Miss Glory. Thank you, Father, for her faithful pursuit into her loving Savior. And God, that is a testimony. We need to hear stories like this. And we celebrate her as you celebrate her. Father, we ask that you give her many more years of just joy to be able to spend time with her loved ones that are, some of them are here today. We ask, God, for you to maximize that time. But most important, until you call her home, she has work. We all have work to do to make disciples, Father, for you. We ask, Father, for you to bless us, bless all those that are here, bless those that are tuning in on Facebook. We give you the glory. In Christ's name we pray. Amen, amen, amen. All right, you are dismissed.